careful though. You go down there and you know, like you know, you it's get not the friend, same right? anymore, right? But yeah. I guess it's an open border, so you'll have no problem getting back and forth, right? <laughs> do you want me to show you guys my? Do you want me to show you my albums real quick? Absolutely, Tim. Okay, sure. I, I let me here. Let me. I'll, I'll just do a quick share. Um, and we're doing APEC tomorrow, so I. Here, right, me, the night before APEC, and we're all here, so that's why it started at 9 p.m. Eastern. I know and that's because because your channel is like contagiously mellow. That's um, so contagiously yeah, mellow. Contagiously Welcome mellow, on, and I'm just contagious today. So you know, <laughs> things up. Uh, so this is my my Flickr album photo. But, but, um, so I have been traveling. I, I just went to Florida. Actually, all of these albums. I, I went to Florida and traveled up the coast with Mark Sokol. We did like a road trip. And so I shot all of these photos. And I'm doing video as we speak. The one that, that might be most interesting, and this was a total surprise, was we had the opportunity to inspect one a very small arts parts, the UFO wreckage. What? Or, supposed. Wow. Wow. So you have some actual potential UFO recovered physical material, meta material that your marks run and pass on at Falcon Space. Yeah, and, and in fact, here let me go down to some of the photos of it. I'll I'll just surf through these. They asked me to watermark them. That's why they're watermarked. So, um, so these are. I, I mean, this is what do you call it? Property of Falcon Space or whatever. And and Mark has this. Um, but Jared and I were both there. Jared was helping him set up equipment, and and I was actually doing filming on that dynamic nuclear polarization thing when when this happened. And so we're like, okay, we'll we'll take a break and just go through it. And so we've been getting like yelled at online by trolls for like four days now. They're like, why would you shine a flashlight at it? I'm like, because what else would you do with it? I don't know. There are like lots of advanced tests that we didn't have the equipment to do, so we may do some of those. But, but ultimately, this is Mark, so I was just helping. So, I'll just get That's that. That's wild. Um, so, so what, what? Have you found anything conclusive? Well, so we did not do the the type of test you can do. There's an isotopic test. That's what Gary Nolan did on Jacques Vallée samples, the Udubawa or whatever it was from South America. That's a destructive test. You actually have to burn a small amount of it. So oh, wow. we can't do that, I don't think. Um, this mm -hmm. is glue that was on it because this was purposes before it was given mm -hmm. to us. So that, that white stuff is glue that was okay. used to mount it for, for, other, for other labs. And um, so was this stuff like the uh, bismuth magnesium composite, or is this different, yeah, or do you know no, yet? No, it, it is. It is. And you can actually see, uh, let me see, if I don't completely suck, you can see the layers. You can sort of see the layers. There, you can kind of see the layers in there. You can also see interesting structures. So I, I noticed a couple... Jared Yates is probably the person to talk about this. And in fact, he is going to. Jared is doing a presentation at APEC tomorrow where he's going to talk about arts parts as well as a ton of other claims about recovered samples. Um, so what I noticed when we were here was if you can see these break points, you probably can't see my mouse, but on the side of it, you can see these ridges that go up and down. What's interesting about those ridges is it, it almost looks like the sides of a canyon wall in desert. They're almost like columns on, up and down, and yet it runs counter. The, they, they run perpendicular to the layering, the business magnesium layering that you were talking about a moment ago. So the, the surface of it is, you know, is like side to side. It's business magnesium layering, but the, where it breaks, it breaks top to bottom, which is really weird. So... It's there may is be, that indication of manufacturing? No, I think it it may be an indication of some kind of internal microstructure. Oh. This was just two different lights. This was a UV light on the bottom and a laser on top. By by the time we got to this point, we were like four hours in. We were just kind of bored. So I heard I heard one theory that they're thinking there there we know, go because of the because of the complexity of the material that 
it was possible these craft were actually like grown. Yeah, it, it, it could be. Yeah. It, could, it could very well be possible. You can see the, the layering a little bit in this as well. <laughs> Excuse did me. They, were they reacting to magnetic fields? It did not. See, we didn't do a ton of tests there, but it, it didn't seem to react much to anything. Just, um, what, what we did see was there was some glittering on the surface, and Jared kind of hypothesized you can see it in some of these photos that there might be like micro spheres or micro crystals here. Uh, so let, I'll stop sharing because that was that was my, my no. That was favorite. really cool though. That was really beautiful. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So he, and he, so and you're taking how are those uh, being recorded? Like how are you getting that close? What are the tools being used? So we we again we were in we were in Mark's uh, lab at Falcon Space and what you know when this came in and it the whole thing took us by surprise and, and so um we were just like okay well what do we have to work with and he had a 4k he had a little 4k microscope that plugged into the computer and oh, so we right did yeah that with the, yeah we did that with the 4k microscope and it, man that thing is so much better than you'd expect it's pretty yeah, awesome i mean that was yeah it was like a 30 dollar ebay thing right so you know, so people have been yelling at us online. They're like, that's not a lab. There are gummy bears on the counter. I'm like, it's not like we're prepared <laughs> for it. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, we we did not see anything that, that screamed extraterrestrial, but it definitely reflected light a little bit differently than we expected. And it looks like it has structures in it. And I think Mark and or Jared may end up doing more. They, they may do more research there. So, I heard his presentation. I think he said that he saw like honeycomb shapes in the structure. So, I don't it, know. That's how. yeah. It, it looked like that. It looked like there were little hexagons. Kinda. I was gonna say it looked kind of looked hexagonal on that. Just on the little pictures you were showing there. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, and and then you know online. It's interesting. On, According on, to Dan Davidson, the hexagon shape has you know real power. Just the shape alone has the ability to harness power, supposedly. Yeah, I'd be I'd be interested to know what the resistance is in the material. I actually, do like a ohm reading test to see if there is a resistance in that nanostructure because it looks like it is a nanostructure. Yeah, that's like, so true. Like a like a uh, amplified graphene uh, crystalline structure, right? Maybe. So what I, what I guess what I can say about it is, again, that the person who gave this to us, we, we have chain of custody on this. So we know, you know, and this can't, I, I can't, they, they, what they said was they don't want to be mobbed by UFO people. And this is one of those things where if their name gets out there, they will be, right? And so, um, so what, what I would say is this, the person that this came from is trusted, reputable, pretty much everybody here probably knows the name, but we can't say who it is. And, and we have chain of custody on it. So it is definitely one of art's parts. Uh, whether or not those are extraterrestrial or just some old hoax, I, I, who knows? It, it has receipts that are attached to NDAs, essentially. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Because well, those, those came in, they went to Art Bell, and then I think they went to Linda Moulton Howe back in the 90s. Travis Taylor did some experiments with them, and... And, uh, and then Linda sent hers out and she had, when you were talking about NDAs attached to receipts, she did that in the 90s also. So there's a lot of history there. Those things have traveled around. Right, well, it's okay if it took a few decades to finally end up in a real science lab and shout out to Mark uh, Sokol at Falcon Space and right, that you were able to do a trip uh, he's one of the founding members of APEC and that we got APEC tomorrow and lots of people here have done APEC presentations and, you know, those that have not yet uh, that are here should probably uh, at least come to the open presentation ad hocs and, you know, show your work. Yeah, as well, and then Mark is, he is kicking serious butt with that dynamic, dynamic nuclear uh, polarization. 
I mean, he just he just got like, right? a like, ton of new machines for that. I so. was gonna say, like, what was the specific one that like really epic piece that was just donated to him? Um, it's with, it's like, some big things? measurement, and and in theory, it lets him liquid cool it down to like liquid helium. But he's gonna use liquid nitrogen because it's uh, it, it's not quite as expensive or hard to do, at least starting out. So he's doing a ton, and then. Um, you know, and then Jared was helping him set it up, and now Jared is back home in Portland, and I'm sure he is pulling his hair out over the Graviflyer again. So, see, I see Nathan smile. Nathan's like, I have all my hair. But J Jared is like, <laughs> <laughs> Right, Nathan, maybe good time to give us an update on uh, what you're working on or getting to with the Graviflyer, because what's exciting about this is that all of you guys working with it and figuring it out, it's like you've been able to recreate each of the steps that Alexi describes in giving the instructions and tuning it. And it's like you're literally what just one or two away from making it do that pop or whatever, and it's actually uh, in the air. Yeah, we're looking into the Tesla coil. I'm completely changing it. Uh, whatever Alexi wrote, was a, it just wasn't right. So... What it is, I'm looking for uh, feedback in it. So instead of looking for that and listening for the sound, right, I'm just going to bypass it. So I'm going to create a Tesla coil with two separate energy sources. One, I'm just going to run for the regular uh, gravity flyer. The second one, 20 to 30 volts higher so I can hit the back feedback because it's just an energy pulse that goes into it. I just have to time it with the piezo buzzer to make sure that I can get the frequencies to hit at the right time. If I can do that, I'm golden. That's that's where it is. So I couldn't find the right stuff. Uh, we've been looking everywhere. And I just decided to build it. So I, I have on my list this uh, next week is about 30 Tesla coils to build. I'm going to go through every single different wire size I can from 20 to 34. I'm going to set them all at 300 hertz. And then I'm going to crank that power, man. So... Where I was hitting five feet away from this craft before, I'm going to hit 20 feet. So I'm going to have no problem with the power. So as long as I can hit that frequency, this thing coming off the ground. That's, that's wild. And that many Tesla coils, it's like, got to be careful you don't also accidentally like open up a portal or something. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it is. Well, you're, you're open talking portals about, responsibly. You're, you're talking or you start about glowing. <laughs> One at a time, right? You plug them in, test them one at a time. Yeah, yeah it's just it, it basically I wanted to make a uh, chart, and I wanted to yeah. see what each one does, and then what the plus and minuses are for my project. So it's just going to be like an overall thing where you can basically buy a ZVS coil, you can buy a couple of capacitors. I'll tell you exactly how many winds to have on this thing, and anybody can have this Tesla coil no matter what. So you just order it with the exact amount that I tell you. It's a done deal, and then it's a start up and go. It's no longer, hey, you know, it's a shot in the dark. I absolutely hate that. So I'm just going to create the list. I'm going to put it out there for free, and everybody can build these things as much as you want. I'm going to show you how to put two energy sources in it. I'm going to show you the switch to switch between both, and I'm going to show you how much power this thing has right away. And look, hey Nathan, I expect to blow up a lot, but I expect to win. We're going to have a grab a flyer race when this is all done. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think it's good to just test different things. You know, so one of my worries is that like the folks who are doing it right now are a little too conservative. Sometimes they're kind of like, if Alexi didn't say it, we're really hesitant to try it, you know, but you know, and, and in a sense, that's really cool. But then I think there's also a time where you just kind of got to go, Try different stuff. Well, there yeah. comes a yeah, point. One you, way to get it. There comes a point when you learn everything, and you learn exactly what he does. There is no more to learn. You know what I mean? You know the exact process. I can sit there and watch the film and tell you exactly when he hits the button. I can tell you exactly the process he did to get it there. I have all of it on film here at the garage. And to be honest with you, I don't need to listen for something. God knows I'm eighty percent deaf right now. I'm not going to hear it. So why wait? You know what I mean? I'm just going to yeah. set up the probe next to it. I'm going to have my oscilloscope in another room, but the probe out there. Hopefully I don't fry more than one. And let's just hit it, you know? That's just the way it's got to be because a lot of this stuff, 
you say he said it, right? But I've seen videos of him. He just goes, okay, they said they wanted the Tesla coil circuit, so I pulled it out of my book. And I'm like, well, that's not very helpful. That, who knows if that's the one you're using? And then he shows it, and he's like, okay, he's 15 feet back at some points, and then some points he's 10 feet back. If you understand that, then you know his Tesla coil cannot be a Slater exciter circuit because you're not going to get that power. So you know he's telling you a lie. So there's no getting around that at this point. And then when you calculate the height of his coil and the uh, width of it, you know what frequency it has to be at to get there and how much power it takes to run that in order to get the distance. This is not giant science here. This is basics of Tesla coil. You're not getting around that. So when somebody tells me, hey, I got a Z44 chip and a Slayer Exciter, I'm just telling them, you know what? Good luck, buddy, because we're not getting there. It's, it's not going to work that way. You're going to have to put more power in it, considering it's the only thing that moves the field. So you think of it like this. He's got a static field around his Tesla field. In order to get that EMI to go as far as it does to take out a space heater, how much power is that going to take? It's going to take you about 80 volts of power going in just to hit that. Just in order to knock that out. If I just sit outside and put a space heater out there plugged in and I hit my Tesla coil, it's going to take at least that to blow it. So when you tell me I'm overpowering it, I'm telling you if that's his result, I have to follow his result, which means there's not enough power in it. Did, did you try to put a gravimeter next to it to see if there's a shift? I did, and, and there's two fields. You have two different lights, two different fields. So when you get close to it, you're going to pick up your uh, static field, and that's pretty easy to pick up because it's on the outside. And then when you get into it, that's going to be your green light. So there's a red light on the outside, green light on the inside. That's your Tesla field. Only when they cross will you pick up both lights. And that's how you know you have the field on this. I have a gravity flyer. You can probably see it hanging on this side back here. The only thing that thing does is get field. So you see it hanging there. Yep. The only research I do on that is fields. So electrical field, the Tesla coil field, the static field. And I push them and pull them. And I play with them. I can jump them. I can put stuff in between to make it jump from one area to the next and come outside the field. I can wreck every piece of electronics in my whole garage in one second. So it's it's a pretty big understanding, and I have a whole giant notebook to show all the results of this thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's gotten to the point on this whole thing where we know what he did. And if you can't see it by now, I try to tell everybody the test to do it, and sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. You know, I have oscilloscopes. So I have all that. I don't show it and I, I just want to make it simple for people to see the reaction. If I showed you all the oscilloscopes and stuff, it'd probably be great for some people. I'd lose half of everybody as soon as I did it. It sounds like you're saying he's totally legit though. That's what it sounds like you're oh, saying, yeah. right? Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. Because Ray, I was do you find that, Sorry to interrupt, though, but the fact that he's giving misinformation and that it seems that so many different breakthrough inventors intentionally always, like, leave out certain details or falsify them and stuff. Yeah, he did. So, but I found a breakthrough invention and I put it on my channel. Have you ever seen a Tesla coil lift a lifter? Well, you know, actually, if I Yes, I have. Bernie, uh, in terms of Alexi, one of the things you got to keep in mind that I forget too is he's he's he doesn't speak English; it's all Russian, and and they're translating it right. So, mm, so, so there's they, a language that, barrier that probably, there. Yeah, that, it adds some complexity. So, well, but all the Russian sciences are Greek word based, so it's actually pretty good. Yeah, what I was trying <laughs> to say was the Tesla coil lifter is at least three pounds. So. You, you yeah. want to look at it, it's got a high voltage top, it's got a high voltage bottom, and it's got a Tesla coil uh, coil in the center, and then it's covered in a wrap of aluminum. It's not your average lifter, and that's kind of the thing. So the Tesla coil coil itself is closer to the top than it is the bottom, and this thing lifts. It kind of gives away the whole thing. As soon as you learn how that one worked, you can then apply it to the gravity flyer. Because it's the same technology. 
There's no difference in it. And I've gotten all kinds of different videos that I share with Jared and Charlie on this. So we should be well versed on this. And there's different types of energy that has to go into those things instead of just doing high voltage coils. No, no, no. There's a whole game changing one that's in there. So you have to change it. And you have to be able to play with frequency, amps, and volts and be comfortable with it. Because this thing is like a dial that you have to hit just right. Yeah. Well, speaking of dials, I just dropped one in chat for Bernie. If Bernie wants to share it. That's Isaiah Ritchie's new one that he's working on. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> Where is this? Oh, it's the uh, it's the TikTok one. Yeah, that's. Oh, okay. Isaiah yeah, Ritchie is out in Portland. He he's actually he's almost neighbors with Jared. He's like a couple. This of miles looks like a Searle effect generator. It it Jeez. is, but you notice there are no coils to power it. Now he he did not tell me how he's doing it, but if I was gonna guess, I would guess that the, the power the coils are probably hidden under the plywood. Yeah. yeah he, sh he showed the video. There's something under the table that spins. Yeah. So what I what I suggested to him was I said uh, earlier today I, I'm gonna fly down and try and film this. I said if you're able to make it work, with yes, please under the table. I said. Maybe you could lift that that SEG up a little bit and like suspend it in the air, you know. So, right. so I guess we'll see. We'll see what he can do with it. That's pretty. Like that's one step closer to like what John Searle had with the triple, and that the two that are rotating, those are also levitated and not connected to anything, right? Yeah, uh, although I think it is being powered by, you know, and he didn't say, this is, I think this is more of a gimmick, right? But um, I believe it's being powered by induction coils under the table. So I don't think there's any magic happening with this. Isaiah is not a hoaxer. I think he just came up with something creative and wanted to say, look, I can do it without having, having all that stuff wrapped around it, you know? For sure. Pretty cool. Yeah. So he's gonna add he's gonna add rollers and layers too. I asked him about that and he said he wants to do more. So we'll see where it goes from here. That thing is heavy, by the way. I mean, I don't maybe fifty pounds, forty pounds. I mean that's like heavy, really? heavy. A lot of metal. Yeah, because it's like a foot something wide. Cause I saw him pick that up when I was there last time and, and he was like straining. He's like you know, just to, so. I like the clean setup. It's very cool. It allows you to see the just the details to focus on just the you know the details of the generator. Yeah, yeah. He he does really good work. And then for me, that's gentlemen. That's all I've got for today. <laughs> well, speaking of coils, uh, Ben, uh, as you walk away. I know. I, I thought he was saying something, but I guess his mic wasn't working, and then he just disappeared into the background there. Yeah, there no, he's go. there. He's there. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Do you want to show uh, what you've been working on, and that uh, you've been replicating and testing the PoE coils, uh, vortex coils that came up with by the Nunez's at One Stop Energy that have since disappeared for like two, th two and a half years now. Nobody can contact them, and all their like material just disappeared off the internet. Yeah, and I have I managed to capture a lot of it. Um, now it's not like the videos that they had. That those they had so many videos, and unfortunately I can't access those. But all the descriptions of their videos, which were you know they actually included diagrams and stuff. That's all you know. I've been including those in my live streams, and you've seen the Nunez circuit, the open circuit. Um, you know that's that's stuff they had on YouTube. Um, that was taken down, and I managed to find, and I put it right back up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this this uh, information Flex. nice. Yeah, this information belongs to everybody. <laughs> so that's the way I see it, and uh, I I just have some conclusions I'd like to read. <laughs> I have some conclusions that I uh, you know I did a live stream a few days ago, and some of you might have. Uh, seen me go over my conclusions, but uh, basically, the Nunez circuit does work. Um, 
the open circuit will not power any load outside of 400 hertz, except when in really high frequency. I saw a small pocket of energy around 21,050 hertz. This tells me it's actually capable of powering a load uh, and it goes against conventional teachings of circuitry because it's using an open circuit. But um, a another interesting thing is, and uh, just a, um, a caveat here, my multimeters aren't rated um, to be accurate above 3K, 3 kilohertz. So okay. but we, still. Can't trust, we can't trust, yeah, we can't trust them at this range, but, but they did display at this range which is uh, around the range that the Nunez method is supposed to work. Remember, my coil is using two less wires, so its resonant frequency is going to be a little bit higher. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, it's going to be uh, a little bit higher. So uh, the 2150, that displayed a 10 times voltage output. It was in the uh, millivolts. It was smaller, but it was like 12 millivolts on the input and 120 millivolts on the output, like to the exact 10 times. It was insane. And I'm like, wait, I just did it. It's a very small amount, but I just did it, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so it does work. You just have to find the right frequency. And what's even more crazy, and I'm going to tell you this, this is just a theory of mine, but Mike, uh, um, or no, uh, Gerald, I think it was Gerald who was saying on live stream earlier, that uh, he was working with his coil and he he confirmed this for me and I haven't been able to confirm it, but it's a theory that the coil has harmonics that are uh, octaves of the phi ratio. So, and what we see in 2150, that's around the third harmonic, which is insane. I mean, even your equipment, I, don't, I mean, within the 3,000 to 3,000 millivolt range, right? So, I mean, that's, that, you should be sensitive to, like, anything, like, usually that doesn't mean, uh, it's not like grams or something, where it's, like, lo like the level of, so you're likely to be able to experience anything like 1 millivolt to 3,000 millivolts, and so your equipment seems like the, ac that's the correct equipment to you, you shouldn't need something even that much more precise, like, what you're saying so it, sounds it accurate. Is, okay. So it does That's actually what I would expect, and it's the correct thing. I mean, it's kind of what we're all seeing here with field. You know, the idea of building field will allow for more energy to be... I mean, this is also why they try to build capacitors, which are just like... They started out as like microscopic rolls of toilet paper, right? For this exact <laughs> purpose, right? But they're, you're, you're, you're definitely using... It sounds like you're proving, you know... I'd like to see... I mean, I haven't seen your last video, so it's interesting to hear these results so quickly, but, like, I would like to see, and I can't wait to see the rest of the work you're working on because of that. Right. Yeah, this is You got a little demo to show right now? Were you set up yeah. then? Or? Yeah, I could. I got a set up. I could show you. Um, I just wanted to go over the second part of my conclusions, which... Is sure, sorry to interrupt. Really, yeah, is actually uh, more crazy um, data. So some exciting developments in the era, area of magnetic synchronicity. And I've been trying to nail this one for a while, and I believe I have the solution. Uh, going back over the strongest effect that I've seen regarding the rodent coil's magnetic field, the neodymium sphere, which fits the tor and complements the coil's field geometry, the strongest effect happens around 7 hertz, uh, 7 to 8 hertz. So uh, it starts spinning up really fast. My tone generator doesn't go below 20 hertz, so I had to go on YouTube and manually find these lower frequencies. Um, nothing seemed to be doing anything above 8 hertz. So I did some research, and it turns out there are theories of the aether that include glass as an amplification for the aether. And in retrospect, in both videos, we see magnetic synchronicity happen with Daniel Nunez and Jack Scholes, where they have the neodymium sphere and the rodent coil. They both use glass for their container. So I decided to test this. And uh, instead of putting it on 7 hertz, I decided to put it on the Schumann resonance, 7.83. And it started doing something really weird. So instead of spinning really fast, it started like spinning slowly, but back and forth, like it wanted to go all the way around. <clears throat> and I, I turned up the, the gain a little bit, and it seemed like it wanted to go all the way around, but I didn't have enough power. And then I took the neodymium sphere outside of the, the vortex, and it was still vibrating the glass like a foot outside the coil. It was insane. So it, that tells me if I pump more, more power into it, I might be able to get it to synchronize fully. Interesting. 
Yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, I'm really excited to roll out phase two testing. I got Mike um, and Nathan uh, helping me with phase two testing. It's probably not going to be for another month or so. I got to gather all the resources, all the uh, uh, equipment to build it. But uh, we're going to be testing the rodent coil on a battery in a, a um, Bendini circuit, the schoolgirl circuit. Awesome. Okay, that's well, pretty cool. Give me one second, and I'm gonna I'm gonna set this up for you guys. I like that. That right? There's so much potential with these coils, and now that you guys are working together, and that's what this is all about. Like uh, earlier today on Ben's channel, the old man builds Nathan here. You guys doing the stream and connecting, and the just the sharing and bringing of all these ideas, technologies, and it coming together. Are you using any software to like model this? Like, have you used Spice or anything like that to do, uh, like, to test what you, you're before you build it? I think he's setting something up. We'll yeah, get back to that. Right? <laughs> oh, you Kill know, him. I should mention in terms oh, of I... if if you guys go, if you guys have a big event that you all go to or something, mm -hmm. I, I'm. I might be able to show up and bring the camera and get promotional photos, which I know is like really annoying for everybody, but like, we'll have to do Tesla tech or something. Yeah. I was, yes. I was thinking that I'm going to miss it this year, but I might go next year. Um, right next year. Let's plan for next year, full year ahead. Then it gives us a lot of time to promote it and I'll get down there. Yeah. You know, I, something like that. I, Dude, that's, I mean, that's what I'm all about. I'm trying to, like, what I'm trying to do is, like, market this community. I know it sounds cheeseball, but, like. <laughs> no, no, it's it's good. It's your vote, right? It's all promotion and getting it out. And the more the better is getting this no, science that's smart. technology. Oh. That's actually something that I recommend to a lot of channels who have important information is they need to, you know, learn how to market themselves um, to, get at, to get the message out there. And networking yeah. is a big part of that. But, yeah, problem is a lot of inventors aren't good at marketing. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get a picture of right. like some. You get a picture of like a shocked vegan screaming like ah on the front of the left side of the t thumbnail, and then you have a picture <laughs> of a laundry machine just shooting money, just shooting money out of the laundry <laughs> machine, and then it just <laughs> says like, and it says like how I got my money for free and then it's like free energy like parentheses really small energy after the free money part well, and our then, community's not that bad but, just but... Lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean because if you think about it like not spending money on your laundry you know machine like there are like six people i know now that have like a free energy oh, solution you for the laundry literally machine turn old laundry machines into <laughs> little hydro power <laughs> generators right yeah, yeah. If Mr. Beast only hey, knew, you don't understand hey, what he's missing out on. Hey, oh. I just made the uh, I just made the Gerard Morin device. He uses a washing machine pump motor uh, to run the generator. I got that See? featured on my uh, site. So, and what's really cool about this uh, uh, pump that you get out of your uh, washing machine, I could spin it up. It's putting out 113 volts. I can put both my fingers on the terminals. I don't get electrocuted. But we don't exactly. recommend trying this at home, kids. Yeah. But let's cut to let's, 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 let's cut to let's cut to a pipeline commercial for natural <laughs> gas. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. But but the funny part is the second you take that power from the washing machine pump and you put it into a transformer, then it becomes lethal. So what's happening inside that pump? If I'm able to put my fingers on the leads, I don't get electrocuted. I can wind it right out. But the second I put it into the transformer, now it's lethal. So what's happening inside that pump motor? You're, you're building it with less and all amps. It, you don't have enough amps in it. Oh, it's got amps, so I can run it, 57 it's, it's watts. It's not usable amps. You're not in AC yet. You're in a uh, sine wave, but you're not in AC yet. Yeah, what I think is happening, I, actually, I think it's a half wave. It's not a full sine wave. Yeah, so it, it's... Fully going right over the surface of you like a, a bird on a high voltage line. Yeah, kind of like the skin effect. Yeah, there thing. you yeah. go. That's what's happening. As soon as you rectify yeah. it, uh-uh, don't touch that. 
Yeah, exactly. As soon as you put it, like I got it hooked up with a 700 watt uh, microwave oven transformer. Yeah. So I put it through that and then I send it to the lights. Plus, you know, so. DC, DC is a little different these days. It's not like your, your Edison's like electric chair DC. We've got a lot of USB peripherals. I'm surprised how much of my life runs in DC now. I'm, I, I used to like swear against it and think we'd all be in some like, en- like AC Nikola Tesla energy field. But USB, man, like I can get a lot out of like non, non AC solar panel without any inversion just using those tools now. Yeah, well, and then all of your battery stuff is DC also, right? So Yeah, exactly. So it's like you can collect in ways you would have thought before, okay, well, that energy I have to like, I have to AC that energy, I have to convert that energy, I'm going to lose a lot in that inversion process to have a pure sine wave inverter. That problem is 10 or 15 years ago now. With all of this crazy stuff from China, all the DC-based stuff, all the half-volt, uh, you know, a USB and yeah, those well, battery systems. Stuff was Jared Morin, right? It's going to China and taking it there. The DC motors and stuff. Like, yeah, what happened to Jared Morin? Can yeah, he just contact he, him these days. Like, he just dropped right off the radar. I think the whole YouTube uh, thing just really uh, cheesed him out. Well, he started manufacturing out of China, and then like right. I think he actually maybe ended up over there. Who knows? Yeah, where's where's like, John? Where's jo- where's John Gold? Right. Uh oh! Uh oh! You busted, Andreas. They don't know the reference. I'm all. People get it. It's like uh, I can always give about eight seconds later. It's not very good for TV, but at least people get it eventually. No, they're still working on it, man. Jared, who? See, it's 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 an age thing. John Galt is a character in Ayn Rand's. Anne Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged, which has had many movie adaptions, movie adaptations, and all of the movies sucked. <laughs> I believe that is why I never watched them, and then didn't read. Yeah, get the books. books. Get the get the Audible. Get 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 the Audible file. You know, listen to it. Maybe that'll help. Listen to it while you drive. In AI Zerdis voice, of course, though. Oh, way better idea. Yeah. Where's that app? She, she had, uh, and the thing is, like, she was talking about uh, trains. Th- that was the big thing in Atlas Shrugged. Like, and that's, I think, one of the things that makes it kind of dated. But she was talking about, like, train barons. She was kind of, it's almost like an 18th century idea. But, like, because she was from Russia, right? And they had lots of trains still in Russia when she moved here. And so she wrote it up based on that. And I think a lot of people, it just doesn't resonate because, like, we're in the automobile age, but I I feel like that it, it's more and more relevant. Like as we become closer and closer to how things were in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, we're less than one yeah. percent own 99 percent of the resources. And also to remember, trains were ubiquitous until World War II. Like the Japanese, the the Californians use the Japanese threat. They're like, what if the the Japanese landed in California? So to just blow up the trains. And this is like that Who Framed Roger Rabbit movie. Like they, it was very recent the destruction of the infrastructure. Of trains and i don't know i feel like around the world especially it's still true but they they have adapted it to be about like uh new fuels new kinds of fuels yeah. and things like that in the movie in, yeah in that last movie. yeah so the atlas shrug was uh let me see what what would the summary be basically it's like the the smartest innovators in the world basically like the in the book like the entire world they just get tired of getting ripped off. Well, I would I would say the innovator. Anytime there is a problem, uh, it's being exploited by a group, like a guild, like a mafia, like a, and this this kind of uh, infrastructure is keeping people paying one hundred and fifty dollars a gallon for gas, or you know. A thousand dollars for a ticket for a train or whatever. Or if you, let's say you're bringing your supplies west and they can charge how much it's going to cost to bring it west because you have to use their trains to transport it. So all of a sudden they can take a huge tariff of your transport, right? So there's this huge monopoly. And somebody comes along with a solution to that. He's like, well, here's something that's like a car or here's something that's another way of getting stuff there. The whole, it's going to revolutionize everything. It's a disruptive technology. Somebody produces a disruptive technology. Oh, that's loud. Oh, it's loud buzz. I'm just going to unplug these for a while. Bernie, can you mute that? Would that be cool? What, oh, what is that? Where? I think it's I think it's Ben oh, it's Benefactor. Ben, oh, yeah, be yeah. 
It was Ben. Sorry. He'll be no. done in a second. I'll be, I'll be done in a second. Oh, I think it's a call. So, so disruptive. I'll be done. Disruptive technology guy comes out with this thing that's going to change the world, make it easier for the proletariat to do all these things and like less scarcity of trade and transportation. So this guild that controls all these things and it's exploiting the scarcity problem, uh, they try to stop these disruptive technologies and they stop these entrepreneurs and innovators. And so eventually these entrepreneurs and innovators all start to leave centered around John Galt, right? John Galt, they're all like, where did he go? Where did he go? And eventually you realize they, they did go somewhere, right? And they're like, they're working yeah, they, together. They, just, they take off, basically. <laughs> they just get tired of it. And they take off. They get tired of being used. They take off. Yeah. So. Okay, hey, Mike, I got a question for you. Right? And Dry Warren, really cool. did you use the induction coil to change the strawberry in taste on the testing that he did? Did you ever do that one? No, I haven't. No. Okay. No, I haven't done that yet. I wanted to see if it tastes different. <laughs> he, right? he took like, the energy from the washing right? machine pump and he ran it into an induction coil, like a little right. heater, and then he put yeah on it, and it's supposed to change the actual taste of it. Really? I I've, I haven't tried that one. Hey, Gerald is around. Oh, Gerald's on, baby. Yeah, maybe we should. They emailed you. Um, we should yeah, Benny uh, solo on Benny and see what he's got all in that lab over there. Man, he's got some big gloves. I haven't used those kind of gloves since I was welding. Oh, pot right. <laughs> Look at those things. I haven't used those gloves since I made cookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <yeah. laughs> wow, I thought it was a little voltage. Yeah, those that, are oven. That's mitts. a cool coil. <laughs> I like the coil. That looks beautiful. Yeah, that's the rodent coil, is that it? Right, it's the P P O E, the Peace on Earth. It's based off of the rodent mathematics, uh, mm -hmm. but it's created by One Stop Energy, the Nunezes. That's yeah, that's a cool coil. Oh, they can see the is it magnet? I, I know, um, Ger I I know Gerard Morin when he was uh, using his pump, he was uh, putting it into. Um, you know, the ionizer transformer. So he was able to get it up to a really high voltage. Then he would uh, put it through a spark gap. And then from there, he was able to run something like a thousand watt uh, sodium uh, uh, crystal uh, lamp that, you know, the hydroponic lamps. Yeah. And uh, he was running that and that gave off a really interesting field, not just like photon or light, but it was the electron field that was accumulating around the ball and the electrode. It was really, really? interesting. Because mm -hmm. that's supposedly where Walter Russell holds patents uh, for achieving noble gas transmutations in those sort of uh, yeah. bulbs. Yeah. And I believe it was with General Electric or something, either that or Bell Laboratories, one or the other. Yeah. But see, the. Yeah, the reason why I built the device the way I did is now I've got a good platform to uh, um, experiment with now. So I got a, something that I could swap stuff out, put stuff in, oh, whatever, boy. add this, add ah. that kind of thing, and you know, experiment with that. Right so at least I got a good platform to work with now. Hundred percent. Yeah, I like it. Looks cool. It's... Yeah, right. it looks really smaller efficient. Ball. Ben, do you have a smaller ball for it? And welcome, Gerald. No, I don't. Unfortunately, I got a bigger ball. Oh, <laughs> nice! I can go larger, not smaller yet. <laughs> so, if anyone's got extra balls, any you know, iron or magnet uh, balls out there, feel free to send them to Ben. Yeah, that's not going to even. Do, that's not going to do it. <laughs> I bet if you had, B, you know what, Ben had. Uh, could you do BBs? That that would be the easiest way. Pick up some BBs at the store. Oh yeah. Good call. Totally good that. idea. Too. Or ball bearings, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. BBs, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah or, uh, oh, bird, bird, bird shot. You can get bird shot shells. And then maybe also see what happens with copper, aluminum ones, iron as well. Compared. Well, I I predict if you were to put copper in there, it might actually start heating up. Oh, yeah, probably. Well, ben, I have a question. Does the rotation of right. the ball... Or iron, ferrite wood. You said what, Lulu? I said 
the the rotation of the little uh, metal balls like i saw it going you know counterclockwise does that is, is that an indicator for anything like if it goes that way or that way so uh in my research with this coil it does seem like and and this is just a a theory of mine it's not been tested but the the cymactics test that we did do indicated that the polarity was switching depending on the frequency so i think depending on the frequency that you have it yes it, it will either do a counterclockwise or clockwise rotation maybe so, so polarity is the uh, it determines the polarity you know? right the frequency it seems like that at least for the cymactics test but again it was a it was a really impromptu test. It was done on like a baking pan and some ionized uh, salt. So, you know, table salt. So it, it wasn't the most accurate test, but it did look like it was switching polarities. Like it was moving a little bit, the the um, north, north okay. and south poles. Hmm. Although when I put a digital pole detector up there, I can't detect the North Pole ever. I've detected a South Pole one time. I think that's when I flipped the donut, but yeah, I've not been able to detect the North Pole at all. Uh, here's an experiment you could do. Um, get get two plants and um, grow them right from from a seed. Put one near your your coil for you know because you're you're probably doing experiments every day, right? So good call, put, Mike. Put put a plant near your your setup. And then put the other plant in another room. That's and like an torture just... chamber for plants. Well, so the Nunez is the some of the videos, some of the last tests they had posted on their YouTube channel before they all disappeared were them literally growing uh, celery and I believe beans in the complete darkness next to these yep. more yeah. advanced and, yes. and that the, you'd see the plants literally growing towards the coil. The closer they were mm -hmm. to the coil, the bigger That's they right. were. And I yeah, have those slides, by the way. I don't know if they were lost on YouTube, but yeah, I yeah, can you share them right now. It looks, if you have, yeah, it, see, it see, yes, we, let me, uh, let me see, see. Wilhelm Wilhelm Reich was doing the si similar testing, and uh, especially with his accumulators, his little <laughs> boxes he was making, and he was noticing that the plants would you know focus away from the sun and actually go towards the box. So the oh. orgon energy that's forming in the box that's coming out of the uh, flex tube, it's actually steel flex tube, they would actually start focusing in that space. They'll actually turn away from the sun and start going towards the box. Now, Eric Dollar did this about 25, 30 years ago. Uh, he just used cans, different size cans, and he insulated it the way uh, Wilhelm Reich told him how to do it, or in his books. And yeah, sure enough, he put it right beside uh, his garden and within a few hours, all the plants start turning away from the sun, focusing towards the direction of where his box was. And he said, right there, I knew it was real. That's so it also, it also grows that. faster in the magnetic field. That's right. Growth, uh, growth rate increases with the magnetic field. So that's why I'm thinking the, the rodent coil setup is going to be enhance the growth rate. So put one in another room away from your setup and just keep the other plant in the area where you're doing your testing every day and just kind of keep a track of the growth rates. You might see some improvement with the plant that's, that's closer to your setup. Oh, definitely. I actually, yeah. for sure. Like if you think about it, like for space, if you know, on a spaceship, like, so you don't really need the sun, you could use a gas to, you know, that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are uh, doing studying electroculture, and um, I forget. It's all, it's all part of the same. It's all part of the same. I think those electroculture. The they're, they're, it's they're, magnet magnetic culture just as much, or even more so, right? As you guys are saying, the magnetic field is just as important, if not more important, than the electric fields. In well, well, I think all, um, it's all part I, and parcel of the same thing. It's like two sides of the same coin. Okay, Bernie, hey, I'm about to share a very hey, Mike. delicate link with you. It's full of everything I have from First Stop Energy's website from the unlinked forum they had. I don't know if we're able to get it again, but this is, I can't share my screen. So if you want to share your screen with it, I'm going to post it in the chat. 
the link. Okay. Um, I was going to share my screen, but but only to cause trouble. So I won't. <laughs> but everybody's That's welcome to it. Um, browse through it. It's got a lot of cool stuff. Everything I was able to find is on that in that folder right there. I can I interest you guys in torsion shear experiments too, please. Yeah. Please. Yes, Shoot. please. Uh, because I I, I that that is my and I know Nathan has a different idea, right? But. That is what I think might be going on in the Gravifier and the Searle effect generator too. Is yeah. torsion shear where you have you're you're twisting the aether, right? But it's counter twists. Mm -hmm. And and the the reason was when, when I went to visit Jared, he was talking about eddy currents on the surface of that disc, that center disc. Yeah. And he kept talking about these eddy currents. And for like two days I I was like, it doesn't mean anything to me. And then then I was like, wait a minute. I was like, that reminds me of torsion shear, which which John Daring and James Corum and a bunch of other people had gotten into. And I was like, man, and so that's been stuck in my head ever since then. But like so basically yeah. have these two yeah. counter rotating magnetic fields right on top of each other, and you're basically like tearing time space. Yeah. So yeah, how, that's gonna how do that you prove that in an experiment to show others. Like let's say you have something like that. But you want to show how that would work. Do you have any ideas on how to do an experiment to do so? Uh, go ahead. I, I I would have to kind of think about it. I mean, I know I'm having a hard time with that one myself. Yeah, because you know, any currents, if it's around any kind of conductive metal, it's going to create heat. I don't right. Yeah, the, the thing that got me was he was talking about two eddy currents going opposite directions that were like right on top of each other. And I was. Yeah. And, yeah, and I was like, like, man, I was like, that sounds, when it, when it popped into my head, I started thinking about it. I'm like, that sounds so much like torsion shear, you know? Yeah, kind of like a bubble inside of a bubble, but the inside bubble is, is counter rotating and the outside bubble is rotating. And by doing so, it creates even more static electricity that could be added to the inside bubble. Yeah. And, and the time reference mm -hmm. difference and... The voltage potential difference, it's just all that comes together. That's amazing. So is Jared running uh, magnets little, on his upper and lower disc? I think little compasses would could be an in, a good indicator if they, you know, start moving erratically, you know you're you know, you're distorting that space. You know, because so like just simple little compasses. If you you know, you put them around it, if they start moving differently. Then that would tell you. you know, experiment. Right. Yeah, is going to be affected by the magnetic field? See yeah. which way it's going, and but like, I mean, these things. I think that you know. Yeah, just put it in the center of your coil and turn the power on, modulate it, and see if it starts spinning it. Then you know you got a vortex spin. Yeah. In in your in your coil or your inductor or whatever very simple way of seeing that so did jared have magnets on the top disc and the bottom disc uh he's he's tried both and i think his his default has been only on the bottom disc but i think he recently put him back on the top last time i did it it just made the center plate just uncontrollably wobble yeah i remember seeing that video yeah it was it was bad I guess maybe the magnets were too high of a magnet. Oh, look what Gerald has pre-set up for a presentation tomorrow. Whoa. But giving us a little sneak peek tonight. Yeah, I picked I, up a few extra meters earlier so that I could demonstrate something. Nice. Uh, um, yeah, Nathan, I, I wish I had better ideas. I'm kind of, I mean, I guess we're all you know well at least me i i will admit to shooting in the dark with it but you know but that torsion thing i was thinking the seg would might might be the same deal well just think of it like this you ever see that uh video you probably all saw it. the magnets on the bottom and you have big coil on top of it and then it jumps in the air i think so and everybody calls it levitation or whatever well it's not interesting that it jumps the first time because it just be bouncing off the tabletop it's interesting when it jumps a second time because then you have an established height of a certain uh, item like the magnet, then the, then the coil jumps off it as well. 
So you get the double jump, and that's what's interesting. That's what I'm looking so for. I, I've got a question for you then, because I've done demonstrations of these vortex coils, uh, a smaller one, two inch, and it can hold itself up two inches above a neodymium magnet, and you can put five times its own weight on top of it, and it'll hold it stably. But that's not considered levitation. Am I correct in assuming so? No, I, I would say it, it, it is. I would just say it's not anomalous. I think if it's levitating for any reason, it's le considered levitation, right? But like maglev would be the same thing. It's, it's known. It's a known value. But it's not. Well, like I'm for maglev. I know I'm doing it really efficiently. Like I'm doing it with five watts. Yeah, you so, can say levitation. Yeah. Right? Okay. You know? cool. Here's a, here's another one. I don't know if you guys know. Uh, Joseph Newman came up with an anti gravity device back in the early '80s. He took a helium balloon, filled it up, and then he wrapped quite a few windings of copper wire around the balloon to the point where it would sit on the ground. It, it wasn't able to lift into the air. And with that wire, he hooked up 220 volts to it, and when he pulsed it the balloon raised off the ground. So that might be a different direction. Electric Somebody charge. might want to try, but yeah, he brought it. Yeah, charge causes types of... Well, what is it doing to the helium? So he's weighted down, down the balloon with the windings around the balloon. Yeah. But the second he started pulsing 220 volts into the coil that's around the balloon, something's happened to the helium inside that makes it raise up and if he did any if he were first to pulse the thing would spin one direction and then flip it again it would go another direction is and it, how is it ionizing the uh, the helium maybe i don't know that's the question Plasma. what is it what, what is it what is it doing to the helium is it exciting it is it making yeah. molecules of the helium speed up because when you heat air the molecules are uh, very energized so that makes a hot air balloon rise well is the electricity or the electromagnetic field that that coil is creating is it reacting in a similar fashion with helium Maybe so it changes the, the pressure the pressure inside by uh, ionizing or something like that and then it maybe so. but interesting concept uh, kind of a different direction that you know, it's uh, easy to replicate. Yeah, I love these uh, trivia's. <laughs> yeah. Makes you think a little bit. I think it, the was... entropy inside of the helium balloon is being, uh, you know, it's getting like uh, the atoms in there. I think the excitation, so it looks like higher entropy. Mm. Is it working for you, Bernie? I'm just clicking through, trying going from uh, trying to find which folder and if it's oh, let's see, maybe. Uh, so sorry, Mike. Is the the balloon? Yeah, it is, it is loading. Sorry, say that again, Phil. Uh, is the balloon in the, made out of plastic and? Sealed? Yeah, just yeah, just the one you would buy at the party shop. Filled okay. it up with helium, just wrapped around uh, thirty gauge um, copper wire around it. Hooked it up to um, a pulse generator that could put out two hundred volts DC, and just pulsed it. And the faster he pulsed it, the faster it would rise off the ground. If you swip the polarity, it would go clockwise, and then flip it the other way, it would go counterclockwise. So he had full control. Yeah, well, it was an interesting experiment, and he did this way back early eighties. Well, what's uh, what's his name? Joseph Newman. Joseph Newman. Yeah, he passed away in 20, 2016. and yeah, he's one of the inventors that it, he's the epitome of an inventor not being a good marketing guy. He was terrible yeah. at. That I think that yeah, actually hurt him. I love him. watching his videos. Yeah, it did for sure it because did, he didn't. It did hurt him. He didn't know how to relay the information to a general audience. You know. That's right. Yeah. 
Uh, and, and following uh, marketing, well, entrepreneurship classes right now, and they teach marketing. So I finally, I finally, finally know uh, more about it. So um, f first of all, did you know that when you try to sell something, you, you don't you don't try to sell what the, the object itself, but you you're trying to sell why you're doing it and the the purpose behind it. Right. That's a uh, that's a good way to sell something in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of selling yourself in a way too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And very, very seldomly does an inventor have that skill. Yeah. It's like you almost, you have to, you have to hire somebody to do it for you because. But it's, it's not complicated once you know it. It's, it's just a, I can tell you as soon as I, I'll, I'll learn it, I'll tell you. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I do. I was in sales ahead. for years. I never sold the product. I only sold the person. Within a few seconds, yeah. I could read that room and I could tell you exactly what you need to hear. And 90% mm -hmm. of the time, had nothing to do with the product. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's not uh, opening a lot of the uh, files. I couldn't find Which any. Files? Like, with the plant growth, like showing the plant uh, ones. Oh yeah, uh, that, never mind. Here it is. That actually, okay. Is that I more see what's right? going on? Oh, there yeah. you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there, well, well, there's a lot in that archive that you can go through. It's it's fascinating. I recommend everybody go through that's it. That's the plants. That's the plant. Growth. Yeah, the plants, yeah. and then one next to the coil being larger there. Yeah, I was even just share a have... picture that said, I, I'm not a vegetarian because I love animals. I'm a vegetarian because I <laughs> hate plants. <laughs> but, uh, the videos were way, way more, and uh, it's hopefully we find Yeah, them, them getting taken down is one of the reasons oh, yeah. why I didn't show my mung bean experiment. I figured they'd take me down right away if I did, so I've just left that so, on the back burner. Well, so Bernie, magnetic. You their videos sorry you seen some of their videos their plant growth videos oh i watched all of them several times i was like oh, talking wow. with them all the time and like yeah it's, uh, i wish i had i, I just actually had that those videos played on my old channel that YouTube deleted when someone oh, porn bombed wow. me. So it's like I had backups, but they're gone. Because oh, how did that happen? You just let on the wrong person. Uh, I was on if I did a forty-eight hour weekend at Bernie's live stream, and twenty-four oh, hours wow. into the live stream, I posted the link for like panelists to join. And at those times, there was like those annoying porn. Bots, and I'm pretty sure it was the dude operating the porn bot that like clicked the link and but he had stolen some like regular community members like profile picture and name so he was like imitating someone so I like let him on and as soon mm, as catfished you yeah yeah just oh wow and it was I like 10 seconds of this guy like wiggling around his, his like probably literally the smallest penis I've ever seen in my life, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and like I then delete like booted him and then I continued the live stream and like had so many other panelists and stuff for another 24 hours. Then it turned out like 48 hour stream and never issue again. And then two weeks later, just my channel disappeared and never again. And it was attached to my university email and it's like deleted for pornography. Oh, that that even makes it worse. I'm sorry. That sucks. That's terrible. Right? Like yeah, when you're over the on, target, they go after like, you. What the f? Mm. I feel it should be reinstated, but the price on here we are. The price to pay when you for your for the fame, you know. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we got Gerald here. That's Mr. Shadow Band. Right. Absolutely. Like hey, you know what? I gotta thank everybody that's out there. You guys have raised my subscriptions to. Let's see. It was at six seventy. I think it's back down to 668 again. I'm not right. sure. I watched it go down a couple times and then go back up. So I'm not I'm not sure where I'm at, but I got to thank everybody that's out there for trying mm -hmm. to boost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know I gave you a shout out on my channel to try to get some. 
Well, apparently you guys can't even find my uh, videos if I give you the title, actually. Yeah, like, I, I don't get any notifications oh, at all. I get them now. That's crazy. That's weird. Do you? Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, at least they're coming out a little bit. <laughs> what are you yeah. doing, right? I, mean, I don't know. I'm just Gotta doing what I'm doing. Yeah, maybe um, have you considered trying to share your stuff to other platforms? So you bring in, you know, outsiders from like maybe Facebook and Twitter. I can't, and get, stuff. I can't get on to other platforms. I've tried. Once a month, um, I try Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I try them all and I don't get emails back. It's like mm. it's interrupted somewhere in between. Even, uh, I even couldn't, Twitter, it, so when it came to Tim and setting up the whole uh tomorrow's presentation and thing i didn't get emails from tim for a week and it showed in my email like six days ago and i'm like what so then i emailed them back right away so i'm getting messed with <laughs> it is what yeah, it is that right? sounds like a problem but i mean if we network uh together we i'm sure we can find some kind of a solution or work around yeah, do a Zoom call when you guys are like, all on. Uh, am I yeah. spelling this oh, right? You yeah. use, a, use oh, a VPN. No, That's you use why. a VPN or something. Gerald. I tried and that. We all like, me to do that. Oh, it does. Yeah, right there. See? Uh, share your stream to our audience. Hopefully that helps boost it a little bit too. Oh, yeah. It's all because of you guys why my subscriptions have gone up. Not, not to say that my subscribers aren't passing it around because... I thank them too. I'm sure they are, but uh, yeah, you know, and just it compiles. So you wanted to maximize. Well, you think about it this way, right? I watched Bernie lose a channel and then open a new one. He's somewhere in the thousands. I had my channel open prior to his. I'm still at 670 ish. Yeah, yeah. See, so, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just the content that I have, and they're small videos that. That definitely could mm, be. I don't no, know. I've been, at, I've been at it for four years. If it's just consoling, I've been week. stuck at 9,340 for a year Listen, and a half now. They will not let the, me get past 10,000. Even with all the highly, highly produced content that I put out, my subscriber rate is like crawling compared to, you know, others um, who started around the same time as me with, you know, relatively the same topics that they discuss and you know like if you watch alchemical science i only started out six months after uh jordan put up his stuff and you know like uh his stuff is very esoteric it's not aimed for a general audience like mine is so in theory mine should be spreading wider and faster you know with the algorithm especially with how highly produced and, and a lot of detail i put into it but it's it's crawling it's like it's working against the flow for some reason i don't understand it Maybe science isn't just sought after the way it used to be. That could be part of it. Too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, or the algorithm just, fa uh, you know, like it's favoring right. stupid shit that people want to see. Yeah, like cats. No, like it's not true. Each other or millions of views on do-it-yourself build videos. You know what? We'll, we'll like, have to yeah, address Look at like the, the shitty free energy videos that are fake and stuff. It's, it's like they get like true. millions of views. It's like, Bernie, we'll have you they, dress they, up they like Taylor Swift. I don't understand that. We'll have wait, Bernie wait. I like Kim's like idea. What was that? Bernie needs to dress up like Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift does there awesome. Go. <laughs> there you Bernita go. Bernita Swift. Bernie. That's right, oh, Bernita. No. That's Maybe I'll wear right. rabbit ears or something and see what happens. <laughs> oh dear. Well, we need thing. a we need a really big YouTuber like engineer to come out and say you know because uh, I see a lot of like really big you know YouTubers like Electric Boom but like at the start of a lot of their videos they're like oh you know well. First of all, we you know like we cannot break the laws of thermodynamics. We can't achieve over unity, and it's like, well, well if you're going to go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say like if you're you're teaching your audience that, and we already know that we can achieve over unity, and you really haven't done a good service to your your viewers. You know, we we need uh, uh, somebody who is able to overcome that mainstream bias. You know, with a big following. Okay, when it comes to the laws of thermodynamics, those are the things that are first touted instantly. The issue with that is the laws of thermodynamics were designed in a, t 
to be under a vacuum and in a linear situation. Whereas right, closed system. What we're, yeah, and what we're talking about is is exactly uh, just the closed system, system and everything is an in. open system. Like, you have an antenna, you open your system, system. and it, it yeah, it's it's crazy. It's literally that everything can be an open system, but they try to apply the law of thermodynamics because saying that you're breaking it it, but it's only under closed systems, and as soon as you have any additional source of energy coming in, well, it still works in the laws of well, thermal dynamics. It's ridiculous. It's been drilled into physics students' minds for years. And and I wouldn't say yeah. it's a form of control as much as it is just a way of, of uh, them directing what research they want in, in comparison to sure. actually having a, the ability to maybe have free energy or over unity. There's also remember, a in 1951, ego. there was a law passed stating that the United States could never have any systems that were 80% or higher. It, it, they true. can't, they won't patent it. It's against um, their law. But there's, there's also That's a big ego patent. amongst yeah. mainstream academia. You know, remember, yeah, yeah. you know, like these people like don't like to admit that they don't know something. You know what but, I mean? I agree, but ego can be overcome. People are people, right? But at the same time, like I get what you mean. It's hard to break through the ice. It really is. No, but uh, if if a PhD says anything against the mainstream, he he, he might he might get uh, banned from publishing. He's not gonna be able to publish anymore. He's gonna lose his reputation, and he might lose his job. So he they just can't, you know. Yeah, yeah, but blacklisted or whatever. Yeah, so you're, they, you're absolutely right. But all the PhDs in the world. All yeah. the master's degrees in the world aren't going to literally add up to squat if one of us hops either a coil or a gravel flyer and, and makes it levitate. It'll exactly. change everything. Well, I got so, news for you guys. I don't use any of those words on my channel. Half the people think I don't even understand them. Like it's people PhD quoting the old time. You're right. It will change everything. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't even bother using them. <laughs> No, yeah, I'm not an academic. I'm really not. I understand the language and you know the the calculations, but I'm not an academic. <laughs> well, like John Hutchinson, the furthest from a academic, and look what he's done, right? It's like well, you kind of. I, I, I mean, universe. if I could offer a, a few thoughts, I, I've done a lot of marketing, and and one of the things that I've found is this is a, a relatively narrow community, and and that's okay, right? Like one of the things in, in these areas is like, you wanna try and get as much reach as possible. But like I promote, cause I do a lot of UFO stuff and, and you know, all sorts of innovative propulsion and stuff like that. And so I will, like I use Facebook groups, I promote there, I go on Twitter, I go on- Facebook yeah. groups is actually really good. You'd be surprised, yeah. right? Like but, but what I found is when you push too far past that core community, you start to pick up people who really aren't that engaged. It's just kind of a game to them. And you don't really, in a weird way, you don't really want them anyways, because they don't contribute anything, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, they're not bad people. They're just interested in other stuff and they don't really care. You know what I mean? So, so Makes in sense. a weird way, it's always going to be kind of a narrow community, but like, one thing I would like is better search engine visibility for some of this stuff. And yeah. that would probably, I don't think it has to be as narrow. If people knew right. like, again, with the laundry machine shooting out money, if there were relatable things that people saw that you could save money, like not just, you could save money. So many people can barely afford to live right now. And so the idea, light on for free this is the next uh, strawberry garden. Live at like here yeah. you go here's the yeah flight with if you can grow your own like food you're saving twenty twenty thousand 20 thousand dollars a year probably if you can grow your own food for a family of like four to six if you're one person i don't know it's like still people spend like 10 to 20 or more i mean they're spending lots of money more and more and more money on foods four times what it costs four oh, yeah. years ago yeah so like growing food's huge having energy that helps with that and then also having being able to not spend energy costs for electricity and having lights and things like that this is huge 
all over the world, places that are off the grid, but also now places that are on the grid that are feeling, I mean, like how many places in California have there been a storm where the power has been out for three days? How many times has there been people in New York City during a snow storm where they had to like have USB outlets at like four different places in the, you know, the entire city that everyone would go to? I, I, mean, I think it's, it's more and more about how this can be applied to your life. And we're, we're like, the comfortable ones able to play with the technologies like well if this doesn't work i'll plug it in right now but i'd like to try it's like when you're the early days of linux so this is cool for people that are curious about the technology right now but it's about to become a necessity not just this um kind of interest of ours that's kind of the way i see i think it's narrow as right now it's a curiosity but it will become a broad necessity well yeah because we have many countries that are going to be dependent on this let me share. I, I want to share my. I don't know if I've shared this with you guys before, but this is something that I've seen, like from doing my podcast. Let me see. That there, that's better. Um, so this is the buying power of the U.S. dollar, right? Because if you go on online and look, and I know, like Andreas, you've probably seen this a million times, but not not everybody keeps track of this. But like the the value when you were talking about food costing four times more. I mean, some of that is profiteering, but some of that is just uh, Tim, the scariest part is if the U.S. dollar loses reserve currency status and what this chart will then look like as hyperinflation. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. I Yeah. I mean, I, it, that really troubles me, you know, and it hits people who like are you know it's it's kind of like the heat it affects you know that summer heat it affects people who are the least able to to deal with it mm -hmm. you know i like to remind people what the hyperinflation was like in germany during the great depression you know they they had to leave work uh during the middle of the day during their break to uh go home and and get paid half of the day so that their wife can go to the store and buy the milk before it doubled in price at the end of the day so prices were literally doubling every single 24 hours yeah i i mean it, i i think that's it's a serious it's a really serious issue you know and it's and it's getting worse right and there i mean i don't know i don't want to get political but i don't really but see either candidate address a, a good solution to that is with like it electro culture or yeah and but how's your like, golf um, swing tim how's my golf swing Ah, uh, but you know what, Andreas, I'll play against you if if you bring your own caddy, if you carry your own gloves. Your gloves. I, I told you already, I would play with you, but it has to be mini golf. Are you prepared? To, are you prepared for that? Are you prepared well, for the little, for the oh, Ferris wheel? I need to a little be there as the referee. You can handle that. Yeah. Oh God! I'm yeah, as I was uh, there, <laughs> with, I like electroculture with electric, like it, it, building these little free energy oh. devices and sustainable, like as the grid goes down more and more, or as food's more scarcer or just you know more expensive, and you're able to grow more or like than enough for yourself, and then sell some off to your neighbors or whatever. Just keep showing it and developing it. Uh, of course, the should grow as a community i'd like to see community wow. things i feel like w with maker spaces it would be nice to see like getting involved with maker spaces in different communities having them work on a free energy project having every maker space that we could reach out to say okay let's build some sort of a coil that is able to you know 10x energy or sustain some sort of a field you know for for novelty purposes so that, they, that people could look at it study it any number of a thousand people a year are coming through any maker space there's hundreds of them in the united states I, at least a hundred in canada i don't know how many so i would like to hear that there are more communities that were just being uh informed about these projects i mean it, it was only what in the 80s 70s and 80s that kids started using the crystal sets right and the crystal radio 60s and 70s crystal radio sets think about how right. big of an impact that had on kids on their way into the sciences and the stems i think it would be really great to see people just thinking about free energy equipment more as kids. Oh, we would right? inspire a well, whole new generation of scientists. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If I could yeah. if I could add to and maybe this would help the maker thing. 
I, maybe not. Maybe it's out of left field. But like when Ben put his coil up a little while ago, to me, I look at that and that's like art. I think that has value as art that goes beyond. You know what? I mean, maybe yeah. it's not generating free energy. Maybe it's not changing the world. But I think that that's really cool to build because it has like artistic value. You know, Tim, I, right? It's like absolutely. all the coils I've made. I've wondered: is it like is it useful or is it just art? Like with the different designs and like. I mean, I think it could be both. But it's at the same time, like uh, the system that I'm running, it's it's uh, more of a, a proof of concept, you know, at this point, really. But so. I think that's part of the that's kind of part of the art, though, right? It's yeah, like, well, yeah. The simplicity of it, it makes it an easy educational material. I got a few coils that work, and then I got about a hundred and. 60 that don't that are art <laughs> right and they all look like art no these so coils are all I beautiful love i love the designs and patterns of the rodent coil all of them are like the star pattern the the traditional donut which is probably really hard to wind they're all beautiful they're you're right they're all art yeah i, I mean the only reason i mention that is i know a lot of people look at their stuff and they're like well you know what exactly does that do what exactly is that supposed to do and and i'm i'm right. kind of like you know what i I think that it has value for its own sake, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. The importance of like, okay, what if a disaster happens? What are you going to do? You know, like, how are you going to uh, charge your cell phone? How are you going to turn on your TV? How are you going to keep your fridge, you know, uh, cold? And, you know, the best place, I think, to market this stuff uh, would be, you know, those people that like, you know, tell you doomsday uh, uh, packages where you have this much food that can Some last. Preppers, right? Uh, no, I, survivalists. I, I'm, I figured, Lulu, I figured that one out. I solved that. So, because I, I was born in 76. I'm a child of like the 80s, right? And so we had the threat of the Cold War hanging over our heads. And eventually I realized that if there is a doomsday scenario, I'm just gonna like die immediately, and then the rest <laughs> of you guys can figure out survival. No, Tim. No, Tim. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm in the first wave out of here. That's <laughs> that, that well. Was, at least you're at peace with your soul, right? You're, I was. You're, you're, uh, you're I was born in. I was born in '73 when they had the uh, oil embargo. Yeah, yeah. People forget about that. Like, the oh, lines. Yeah. Is here. And I'm pretty sure, like, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be hit by something big. And, you know, like, let's say a lot of Houston is going to go, like, there's not going to be power for, like, weeks. And, you know, and so, and not a lot of people can afford generators. You know, the a good working generator is, like, $500 plus, dollars, and a lot of people can't afford that. But if, you know... Or the fuel to then have to put in that, right? Yeah, like, fuel well, imagine that. having well, one of these coils in the trunk of your car along with the spare tire, you know? You exactly. hook it up to what, like a 9-volt battery to jumpstart your car? <laughs> I'll, I'll yep. do you one better. These imagine one of those need coils. Even the power cells that I'm working on could be a real game changer for a lot of people, right? Because it's a solid-state device. So I'm working on that really, really hard right now. Yeah, Actually, like, you, 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 for you, sure. You, you took and then the, the other, the other fallback is move to the Seattle area because nothing ever happens here. Like, nah. you know, like I'm still the big it. one. Well, or unless you start cash app and then get stabbed walking to your car, apparently, or uh, or Seattle? um. I heard San Francisco is really bad. And, and, uh, well, I'm halfway between Seattle and Van. So, and Van is so the same oh, yeah. To go yeah. back to your idea about the Tesla conference, I think that's brilliant. And if we can't do the Tesla conference, I think we should start our own conference. Well, yeah. do an actual APEC meetup conference. There so, we go. Uh, we got to pick a spot. Oh, there we go. Yeah. If I, yeah, if you could give me just a, just a sec. The, so, um, the the SCU right the UFO guys we are in talks with them about APEC becoming a part of like a part of their coalition and if that's the case we might end up like basically tailgating on their live conference and so that's a possibility or if you guys all wanted to get together at Tesla Tech like next year let me know and I'll bring I'll bring the camera and I'll do video yes, and I'll do the whole thing we're gonna do both oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm committed to both. I'll go. So, yeah. Where, like where is the Tesla Tech? Usually, they're usually Tesla Tech's Albuquerque. 
New Mexico. And he and yeah. Steve invited me this year, but I, I I'm traveling, so I'm I'm going to Jim Woodward's. Um, so I'm going to do interviews with Jim Woodward and Curtis Horn, and and then uh, and then I'm going back to Portland to see Jared's Gravaflyer and Isaiah's SEG. And then after that, I'm probably just going to collapse. Nice. Because- I'm so jealous right now. You get to see a Gravaflyer and an SEG. So, Tim, why you, <laughs> why you can't be the first to go, well, we just have to get it done before the apocalypse, I guess, is the moral of the story. But by the time you're done all your travels, we'll have gotten a UFO or a portal Dude, for you. Dude, I downgraded so I I downgraded from the apocalypse. I like it doesn't even have to be doomsday. I'm thinking about like taking it taking the level down to like minor flooding, you know? <laughs> like it, minor flooding, that's it. I'm gone, you know. <laughs> no, but so hey, I, it's still biblical. It's still biblical. It is. It is exactly. <laughs> hey, everybody's forgot about an asteroid strike. That's the scariest. I don't think the dinosaurs forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or yeah. The, the killer bees. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was deadly thinking when I was younger about the states in Canada, and I'm telling you, it's not pretty. I pray it doesn't happen. But the funny part is, is last week I was watching somebody who had that very same dream, except they didn't go to the same extent that I did. And it starts with a meteor. And then hits the East Coast, starts a tidal wave, which also starts a chain reaction where the New Madrid splits. But because the New Madrid splits, Yellowstone goes off, 30% value. The concussion from that sets off Cascadia, and it splits from Louisiana, the, the New Madrid, all the way up through Canada, and then it turns a left in Manitoba, all the way through up to Alaska. See how complicated okay, this now is, you're giving me nightmares. See how complicated this wow. is? <laughs> so what you're saying he is... is that I, I agree with you, Tim. First like, right, have to go a little your, bit your further mad, north. Your next scenario is way too complicated. Like, you, you have to get to a specific... There's only like 10% of the Earth that's Mad Max worthy, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be Antarctica <laughs> and <laughs> the North Polish air of, like, Alaska, probably, never right? Know, like... Yeah, well, it's not California. I'm pretty sure Armageddon already happened there. So, oh. yeah. a long time ago. Especially <laughs> in San Francisco. Those cities are terrible. I was in New Jersey last week, also. That was because that's where Mark is, is New Jersey. And which New Jersey, I didn't realize this. New Jersey is basically kind of like, uh, like left New York City. Like, it's, it's basically it's New York City. It's yeah. like New York just so, expanded to eat Jersey. We're going to have yeah. to... Where is it to Atlantic City? And that's wait, north. Got, I think that's north. Okay, well, Atlantic I guess we're going to have to host it by in New Jersey for by Falcon Space and by Jeremy, right? And then uh, we'll invite uh, Jersey Shore to the APEC conference. <laughs> there you go, Jersey right? is really smoggy. I was really surprised. I mean... Like, I, I remember looking up and it was like really cloudy and nasty. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's that's like blue sky. And then I that's looked why we need to like, get. Yeah, yeah I'm going at. Well, I mean, so it's really muggy there and everybody's everybody's angry. And so, well, I was, yeah. was going to say New York, that's why we that's need to get more, New York. more people building thunderstorm generators, you know, clean up some of the smog retrofit them to their automobiles like uh, we had at the Cosmic Summit. That was cool. Yeah, that, that, that's that's something I noticed. On you go to New York, you cross the street, people in cars will speed up. They try to kill you, but if you go in, <laughs> if you go in California, oh, they'll wow. stop and they'll make you. Uh, they'll they'll wait until you you walk to the street. That's you know yep. what, I, I, I British Columbia is where it's at. I'm like right near. Yeah, there. right, Tim. You just gotta come north. You survive the apocalypse in Canada. You will that's be right. great. And people are. Do you call it British Columbia? No, British. Pl- it will British be. Pl- I like. British I think it's going to be Burnish in the future. It With already is Burnish, Columbia. <laughs> yeah, because I have a family ranch there and many relatives, and yeah, right. Burnish, that's Columbia. Cool. That's where it's at. They have an island. You know that island, the island where they Re- grow weed. Re- I, I don't remember the. They grow weed everywhere. The island of Burnlandia. No, I'm serious. Okay, back when weed was illegal, that uh, like back <laughs> in the day when I when I was in college. Now you're dating yourself. 
yeah, when I was in college, uh, there was there was this. It was like a mythical island. I swear to God, this was a mythical island up off the coast of Canada, where it Victoria. Was, no, it was. It's a smaller one. I forgot the name of it, but the idea was um, you had to take a ferry to get out there, and they only had like one cop, and he didn't care about it. And Bella so, Kula. Oh, so, that was not mythical. That cop was probably that getting island. high. No, that that sounds like fun. every <laughs> island off the coast of Canada I've ever heard of. But probably Victoria is like the one that I experienced that with. No, it was it exactly was, the same situation. It wasn't that big. Victoria's big. This was a smaller no, one. No, no, no. Yeah. I know what yeah, you're yeah. talking about. I've seen it. It's uh, actually not part of Canada. It's in no man's land. Could and be. it's a small community. And they have at the center of the island, they have this gated off area. And everybody shares like the equipment, uh, pumps, uh, lawnmowers, uh, generators, whatever they need. It's a close knit community and just everybody shares with everybody. And apparently it's working really, really well. And most people that have jobs, they have to take a boat to the mainland to go to work, right? But the island's actually not part of Canada. It's not. It's not Prince. Out. I'm just trying to look it up now. I don't remember. Yeah, people, it's off the cor uh, off the coast of There's Victoria. A few different um, epic ones, but yeah, right. There is that one that's not Canadian. It's like a the, commune the, the, or something. The, the, I don't know. Just, the, the, what do they qualify the, as? I just remember we had a friend in college who went up there and he came back and he's like, "It's real." It's <laughs> better than, he's like, "It's better oh, yeah. than they said." Like the beach, you ever see that movie, The Beach? Oh yeah, <laughs> the beach, yeah. yeah that's where they, they, they filmed the uh, the first Rambo movie around there. In, uh, Ram uh, oh, uh, up in BC, in you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they film a ton of stuff up there because I, originally it was because costs were less, right? But then. Now they have so many studios up there. They have a ton of studios. So, like we got to make an island off the like a movie where the island of Burnish Columbia and there's the, like there's this crazy old man who has this weed forest. It's not just a garden. These plants are like thirty feet tall, thick oh. as redwoods and Lizzo. And you know they've got maple taps on all the weed plants, just like <laughs> in the land <laughs> of Burnlandia. Yeah, <laughs> the people that live there, you'll find exactly what you just said. There, there's newspapers. <laughs> Paper clippings <laughs> of this one mountain forest that was all weed crops, and that the farmer was feeding the b local bear population dog food on the regular as the guard bears. And yeah, like it was like a <laughs> mountain of marijuana guarded by uh, oh weed God. bears. That's and great. yeah, that's Burnlandia. It was literally in this, like just in the same mountain chain as my family ranch up in the Kootenays. Yeah. Oh, oh it sounds like an adventure waiting to happen. <laughs> now that I'm pushing 50, it's, it's coffee and aspirin every but. year. And if that bear had landed just like 20 minutes later, he might have landed in Canada and it would have been, it wouldn't have been cocaine. He would have been fine. He would have been in British Columbia. <laughs> British Columbia instead of Colombian Columbia. Right? And. So we, there's actually a lot of free energy conference in BC too, I think, or over the border in Washington there, like Aaron Maxim. Oh, I can never get his name right. Mike, you know. Aaron Marikami. There we go. Marikami, <laughs> yes. Doesn't he do it there? Energy Science and Technology Conference, I believe so, yeah. Maybe that's one we should all aim to go and meet up at. Kind of close. Whatever happened to the Breakthrough Energy Conference? I noticed that <sighs> on their website, you they don't have any recent videos. You mean cool. Kofi, right? No, Global Breakthrough Energy Movement oh, no. or Conference, wasn't it? Yeah, Movement Conference, something like that. Yeah, it was, I believe, in Switzerland or Sweden or something. But, uh, yeah, it stopped a few years since COVID. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I noticed that they only have, like, up to 2019 was the last... Uh, conference that they had on their website yeah. it could be covid related i mean a lot of that stuff you know but that doesn't mean they're gone forever right a lot of that stuff took a hit for covid and maybe it went online or you know maybe they'll bring it back and hopefully but there's the one in uh what was it again mike and what is, is it Washington? Uh, I know um, it's in Idaho. Idaho. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's where we're a lot of how to meet up. All right. Yeah, that's where um, the energy, science, and technology. That's where Bendini did a lot of his conferences in um, in Idaho. That's where he lived. So, yeah, they do travel. Eric Solard's to always there too. Not for everyone here. Well, the last last one, I think he was there, but the one before that, he wasn't because he was fighting cancer. He had lymphoma, so he seemed to have got over that. So he's still going. I think uh, right now the biggest guy that they have going now, well, since Paul Babcock passed away, is the young guy Griffin Brock. He's kind of like Dollard's little protege. So that's one guy to watch, uh, Griffin Brock. He's replicating a lot of the original Tesla gear so oh by by the by the way guys before uh, it's been almost two hours but i just want to say that uh, in august uh some some professional laboratory accepted to to replicate my experiments and it's gonna cost twenty thousand dollars but they'll pay 60 percent of it and i need to pay the rest so eight thousand dollars and uh, yeah, so uh, that's good um, news. That's really good news. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. In August, yeah. we'll, we'll know officially uh, the, the results with greater power and so on. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, meanwhile, I need to uh, I need to sell my chocolates to make uh, eight thousand dollars. <laughs> that's <laughs> a lot of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I need to start soon next week. So you do so, you would do the door. Prior to that, we're talking about Tesla, and I, I haven't really revealed this yet. So I guess I could just mention it now. I don't think of it as a big deal, but I found a way of using water as a ground line. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to my local creek, and I'm going to see what sort of distance I can get out of using that creek as a ground line. So, oh my um, my! Yeah, that'll wireless. be that'll be cool. Yeah, yeah one that, wire wireless. I've done it in a, a big huge bowl from one side of the bowl to the other, and right. no issues. I've got LEDs lighting up. It completes the circuit. So really, yeah. I want to do it in a creek and see if there's a difference so, between dirty and that's clean interesting. Water. I think uh, there's a video of Daniel Nunez doing something similar where there's a specific frequency he's putting into a cup of water. And uh, yeah, slightly circuit. different though. I'm using the water as a ground, yeah. That's so, what's the, just, just what was like, the what you're saying, Gerald? You could, like, that's quite the extra like potential to be adding in. That. Like, uh, you gotta record it and you gotta use that in the APEC okay. conference tomorrow. And definitely, uh, definitely. right, about, get, I don't know about being in the conference, I don't, I'm not sure I'll have time to do the editing. By the time I get back, well, if it's still live and drawing power, right? Just keep it running from when you set it up. I can't. I have to go like way far away from my house. The the water is safe to touch when when you're using it. When you're uh, using the device, the water is safe to touch. It's not gonna like shock you or anything. Oh yeah, I've stuck my hand in it. (laughs) I've been shocked so many times. I don't care. So for me, it was just like, well. Let's see what happens. Uh, right. Oh, so my using God. the river as, as the It almost ground. feels good and now. Then, Ger- Gerald's got I've, the most scientific method of any of us. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> oh, you know, Malcolm right? Bendel infused himself with 250,000 volts. He infused himself uh, with plasmoids. So. Yeah, he says plasmoids, but how does he really know? Does he have some yeah. sort of electron microscope <laughs> that's telling, like you're seeing plasmoids in his blood? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the thought. Is it all blood plasma? It is an interesting idea, and there isn't really no way of knowing. Honestly, we That's we unless point, right? I could say I put one hundred and fifty thousand balls of of testosterone in my blood. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm not saying he's lying. Really, I'm not. I like Malcolm Bendall. I love his design. I think he's he's onto something that's absolutely amazing. But the whole plasmoid thing, a little hard for me to grasp. That's all it I'm is. Saying. It's intense. I, it's I've intense. been wrong before, but for me, it's a little hard. Uh, if you read the book, The Shaman, it goes into all sorts of crazy stuff that 
it's hard to believe, honestly. You know, you don't know what to make of all of it. But it's, yeah, it's Winter it's, and uh, Mehra and Keshi have been covering like plasma stuff and th plasmids and how it also gets into consciousness a lot over the years too. It's, yeah, there's it's, theories. You that don't that understand that. I'm not saying that you can't import energy into the body, but I don't believe it's done through plasmoids. I believe it's done through light with sound pushing that light through your body and adding that energy to each cell. Therefore, maybe pausing time for the human body, not stopping it and not returning it back to the way it was. You can't retard time, but you may be able to give enough energy into each cell of your body through that mechanism that allows you to pause the aging mechanism of the, of the body itself. It's, it's a theory I have I've been working on. It goes pretty deep into like lamins and each cell and what's contained in each cell, but that's something I can get into in a, in a future date. So you wouldn't I'm consider it time manipulation, but more of like uh, DNA manipulation? Well, time manipulation perhaps, but more like time energy being uh, imparted into each cell in a way that it, it pauses your aging ability. So I don't know about time manipulation itself, more as energy as a time negation. If, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's not quite the right term. I'm, yeah, I'm using, yeah. but. You, just, uh, you just increase the energy density and it's going to slow down time. And exactly. It's like infusing uh, the energy okay. of your body through energy density, through light and hmm. sound. Or, or uh, mag mag magnetic, electromagnetic, or gravito electromagnetic energy. Or all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, I'm going to bail out on you for now. Yeah, no worries. We're coming I, to an end. I want to tell you guys before we end something an object that I found, which I thought really was cool. It's a kitchen whisk, right? Like the ones that you do. But look at the coil structure in on this. That is cool. You put you a charge on it. Put, a, uh, put, put some voltage put, on it. See what it does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> look at look at how many coils in a coil. Like there's four. The like, coil within one. the coil within the coil. <laughs> gyroscope. Yeah. Trip coil. Like it's one of the coolest little things. And I I figured maybe you know this uh, might work. Yeah. You know, let's see what it That's does. That's really neat. Yeah. Put it into a plasma but, tube. The yeah, but I, how they had the little, like, I don't know if you could see. Oops. There she goes. Oh. All right, Tim. Well, have a good night, sir. I know you got some editing to do. Rest up your voice, and we will see everybody. Yeah, well, uh, see Apex you guys, man. Tomorrow. And stay healthy. Yeah, have, a our, night, we'll see tomorrow. Tomorrow. have a good one, guys. You as well, Peace. brother. Um, closing words uh, for everyone, and then with five minutes left, I promised Mike I would play uh, his design of, I guess it's the swastika generator, but... Uh, Gamadian. Use right, the Gamadian uh, word. Right? But, yeah. Anywho, close words, Nathan, uh, Mike? Gerald, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, yep. so am I. I've been working on the presentation all week. I've got it on my computer. Everything seems to be working okay. Uh, as long as I don't get smacked down by some other force I'm not looking at or seeing, I'm going to be there. <laughs> Is that conference available online? What's that? Uh, it's APEC, it yes. We'll be streaming it on all our channels too. APEC, yeah. Starts at uh, two, I believe, and goes to late or something like that. Are you at the beginning or at the end of the? Uh, the I'm at four, four or six. I'm towards the end. Okay. Before Mark Sokol does the the update for the okay, cool. staff or whatever they're doing there. Okay. Awesome. So, peace, dudes, and uh, take it easy, man. Nice Heck yeah, this gonna be fun. Congratulations you. on your upcoming test this summer. Thanks. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for that amount of money you have to be. <laughs> oh, I got one more thing to say to Bernie. The trailer, and this is just something that you guys can all think about, the big project that I'm working on. 
the trailer's 90% done. I got a bunch of welding in today and everything. When I'm done this project I've been talking about and sort of leading on to, I'll do a, a big demonstration. Nice. And it'll be live when I do it. So, But uh, I'm almost done. So, Bernie, well, I'm uh, excited for that. I'll be contacting you shortly. Looking forward to it. And yeah. it's going to be one awesome summer. Summer of 2024. Right. All right. Well, promised Mike we would play uh, his design here in the Iron V Gate Pulse Motor. Oop. We're not seeing it burn. Oh, there we go. Can you hear it? No. Okay. Sorry? No. Don't have any sound. No sound? Okay. My apologies. One second. Nope. Yeah, I got a reloader here. Hopefully, the computer doesn't freeze. And APEC in the morning. And so on. Just an idea. Oops. Um, come on. Okay. Sound now? What we have here is a piece of iron. Another piece of iron. This is a shaft connected to a three-phase generator for alternating current output. The shaft connects to here at which point you have four large ferrite rectangular cube magnets in these dimensions to the iron. Same length, same thickness as the iron that you're using. The north fields are pointing out. This is... Um, taking advantage of the V-gate system, V-gate magnetic force pull motor. As you can see here, here's a piece of iron and you have, you know, another piece of iron, uh, a, a magnet here, right? So even though the north is here and the south is, is there, it doesn't matter because this whole side of this piece of magnet will be pulled to this piece of iron just by its position. It's gonna make this go down. This, this, this magnet is gonna wanna turn that way. It's gonna wanna pull this way actually because it's a magnet and that's iron. Even though the north is here and the south is here, the side of the magnet is gonna pull to the iron also, which is gonna induce motion that way. And then the north is going to get closer to here. And the whole piece of magnet's going to get overall 90 degrees right there. You can see that the whole magnet is it's turning, gets closer to the iron overall. You know, you can see there with the pen pretending to be the magnet as it turns. You have a 90 degree there and all this magnet space this entire magnet's face or side is pulling to that iron. Anyway, the irons are wrapped with coils here at the tip, the iron bars. And when your north field gets there, you will trigger the coil to push it along. Try not to use any more energy than you need to, to, to just break the connection between the north here and the tip of this iron. You don't need to really push it, just break the connection and try to only use the pull force of the magnet to the iron as your power source. 
that's the concept here I'm trying to drive home. And likewise, as this magnet is being pulled that way, the one down here is being pulled this way. So you have two, two, two uh, fields of force going on here between this piece of magnet and this piece of magnet. It's pulling there. And then, you know, your next set of magnets and so on. Just an idea. Uh, you know, comment. Let me know what you think. This is harnessing the V-gate force. And, and you got to have two pieces of iron. You notice that this, this tip of this iron is here. And then this tip of this iron is here. That's important to have them positioned that way, in my opinion. Due to the pull force of the ferrite magnet to the iron core. And hence the other ferrite magnet here pulling to this iron core. So you're going to have force going this way from this magnet and this core and force going this way from this magnet and this core. And when these turn this way, these other two magnets are now lining up for the next pull force. And you have, you have your coils wrapped around here to trigger them when the magnet gets there, just like the Bedini motor, pulse motor, any reed switch, whatever you want to use, and another coil here. You can wire the coils together in series and trigger them at the same time with one transistor or one reed switch. Or you can wire them separately over and out. You crazy mother. Yeah. It's just burning. Tired of typing tons of notes during class? There's finally a better way. It's called Otter. Let's say I'm in class. Alrighty. We will call that a wrap. And thank you, everyone. Feel free to stay around and talk if you want. Uh, I got to run as the wife's color, but I will see you all tomorrow uh, at APEC. Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. Thanks, buddy. Bye.